very glad to be here today and uh, a very nice crowd as well. I'm going to spill the beans and just say this. Um, I, I hope to prove that science is a religion. But I also hope to demonstrate how we in my field look at religion and what the problem is between, we could say, atheism uh, and atheist scientific materialism and classical monotheism. One of my favorite Japanese Buddhist philosophers, Keiji Nishitani, said that most of Western atheism is really a meditation on Christianity. Whoa, now that's an odd thought. Because we're going to find out, as I did, my father was a liberal Protestant existentialist minister. And so I was never raised with the idea of the myths of Genesis and so forth as more than story and metaphor. As I branched out towards Buddhist thought, I realized there is no God. And how can we have a religion without God in it? So I'm going to look at the East-West view. But first, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. And I want to play this clip and ask, and please, uh, you know, I know we have scientists and believers in the room. It's great if it gets hot and heated. So I like that. And uh, feel free to argue. Uh, that's how you get brownie points in my class. <laughs> so let's watch this, and then I want to hear from anyone out there what's going on with this. Because a big question, you know, that we have, when does religion actually begin? Is it just a human phenomenon, or is it even older than that? When they come upon the carcass of an elephant, they become tense and quiet and approach it cautiously. They do not behave this way toward the bones of other elephants. Elephants seem to have some sort of awareness. So what's going on there from, from you all in the crowd? Is, is that a religious activity, or are they mindless brutes governed by spy instinct only? Who, who would like to comment? Anybody? Is it religious? Because I, I think so. Yes? I would define uh, religion anthropologically as our response to a higher power. Uh, I don't think there's an awareness of a higher power there, but there is, and I, I'm not, don't remember my brain theory, but I know that there's a reptilian brain, and there's, uh, in mammal brains, there is an element that does allow affection. Yeah. So I think that's probably that element. Yeah, I'm not arguing that these are theologians, you know, of ancient Rome, nothing like that. Uh, any other thoughts on this? I'll just share maybe then my own impression. My dog, Barney, when I would come home uh, from school, would jump up to my face and try and lick it. He was so excited to see me that I would like to suggest that maybe I was his god in a certain sense, his higher power in that sense. So I'm just throwing that out there. This is very controversial to say religion starts with animals. Yes, comment, Steve? Maybe this just represents a recognition of self and the importance of self rather than, I don't know if you can necessarily extend it to religion, but they see you know, themselves as capable of dying, and, and that's the importance that they're ascribing to it. Fair comments. Fair comments. It's very tricky. When we talk about the human animal, though, we tend to think we're capable of more than those so-called lower animals, dolphins and sea whales and things like that. Uh, but we know human beings all start every culture with shamans. 
uh, and this is one example. And so someone in the community who channels spirits, for lack of a better word, uh, and when I look at religion, kind of like the development of the brain you were talking about, I tend to see religion in this kind of manner, like this tree of life chart here. The age of fishes, let's call it the age of shamans and tribal religion. And then with the invention of agriculture, we see a domination by henotheistic systems like Zeus and Jupiter and the like. And then as evolution transpires, and I'll go through some of this a little more clearly, uh, we get to the age of the classic religions, Christianity, Islam, uh, really starting with Buddhism and Judaism. Uh, and then I'm going to say the age of mammals is something like the modern age of science. And you'll know that in the age of mammals, mammals may dominate, but there are still remnants of the other trees there. So religion will always be around, but has it been replaced by science? We know that this, at least this Neanderthal man over here, buried as dead, and seems to have had <coughs> magical amulets, things like that. Uh, and as for the other humans, then we have a question. If religion doesn't exist, say, in this seemingly more brute specimen of human, and these are all humans, hard to believe, but true, uh, where did religion begin? And I'm going to suggest at least Neanderthals, and of course this is Homo sapiens propaganda. He's the only one with a shave and a haircut. Not quite fair. And of course we wiped all the others out with this deadly killing machine. And I think we all know that as much as religions are about peace, they're also a lot about war. And so religions spread through warfare as much as through kindly dialogue with friends. Uh, and this is how Homo sapiens spread itself through the planet uh, with the atlatl, which extended throwing range. And so the little guys, Floriensis here, used to run around in China, but is gone. We can say all the religions we have are Homo sapiens religions. Seems silly to say, but I think there were other human religions prior to this time. Now, this is the problem we get into. If we think about religion in the classic Western Christian sense, then we're going to say, well, science and religion are at odds. And here are classic definitions. Being bound to God is from the root word lig, like a ligament, holds your tendons, hold your bones together, make them function. Religion, relig, means to bind tightly. But nowadays in my field, this just won't function because we know in this global era, era of imperialism, there are religions with no gods in them. So what do we do with those strange things? Uh, and when we look at the vast scope of the development of religion, we can see the beginnings of agriculture here in ancient Sumer. And then I like to say agriculture, and then thus civilization spreads like a virus throughout our planet. Now we kind of like civilization, but in fact, we also know civilization is enormously destructive. So with this big shift in evolution of human consciousness from tribal shamans now to to civilizations increasingly large. Uh, and there is the Bible's view of Babylon. But the Bible's quite right to pin, if not creation, uh, in the Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, and there's the original ziggurat of Babel. Uh, but it is quite right to pin the origins of civilization between the Tigris and Euphrates, or modern Iraq. So the Bible has some accurate bits in it. In fact, it preserves many ancient elements in fact, we can say everything comes from Sumer, maths, writing, the wheel, um, and the zodiac, and so forth. So the Bible and ancient literature preserves these ancient moments. Uh, and this is essentially the pattern you find among the religions of ancient city-states. Uh, no longer tribal shamans. And of course, shamanism is all about the family and the community. These religions are removed from that. 
with great temples like the ziggurat we just saw, where we have an official priesthood instead of the local shaman and a family-based tribal religion. And so here we can see Zeus uh, looking over the pantheon. And now these gods mirror the city-states to some degree. Uh, Zeus is kind of like the mayor of the city. Who would be the Department of Defense? Anybody? Uh, who would be the Department of Education? Athena, we could say Apollo, we could debate that. The point is the religions now start to mirror the human civilization, just as it had in the tribal phase. Now, were those people really stupid and ancient and primitive, or were they answering the same questions we have today without the sophistication we have today? So, one ancient myth from Sumer says, uh, the world emerged from a chaotic ocean. Out of the ocean came the primordial mountain, which begat heaven and earth as male and female. That's a pretty standard creation story, but we're usually wanting to laugh at some of them, like this one. And of course, uh, the turtle holding the elephants, holding a disc a round disk. That's how many ancients saw the world. And the sky was a firmament, so it was hard. And God, you can see it in Job, lets rain through trap doors in the ceiling. So that's old stuff. Uh, once asked a Brahmin, well, geez, what's under the turtle? And he said, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> I need a badump bump machine. Need to add that, Matt. But let's look at this now. What's this? What's crazier than the turtle myth of origins? Than that everything in this room came from a dime-sized spot of nothing. Now, I think that Brahmin and the turtles, if I gave him this Big Bang Theory view, will laugh at that and say, you're mad. That's not even thinkable. And yet that is what science tells us, as best as it knows today, how things emerge. So this is much more sophisticated than the primeval mountain. Nevertheless, it's answering the same religious question as those old myths. Now, in my field, there are two big wings. One is a little more classically religious, represented by Eliade. Here, Mircea Eliade discovered through his research that every, really he's the discoverer of the existence of the shaman and core themes and patterns that we can, he could generalize about every culture. So every culture has sacred centers, rituals, ethics, all of that. So he's a genius. Uh, and then I chose Jesus as a sample shaman among the big guys. Uh, he does the healing. That's what the religious people used to mostly do in the tribal phase. Uh, and so his view, we might argue with this. I haven't made my case with him here yet. I know that. He says everyone has an idea of the sacred or an ultimate concern, as Paul Tillich put it. Uh, and it doesn't matter. My favorite example in my class is Packerism, right? <laughs> Am I wrong? Is Packerism not a religion? <laughs> One woman told me her husband, before each game, has to get his favorite jersey and his six packs lined up and his snacks so that he doesn't have to do anything but watch that game. So I think he's right in this, but I don't think this is sufficient to make this case. Now, Carl Jaspers here discovered another astounding thing, kind of obvious when we think back about it. But at the middle of the first millennium, before the Common Era, he realized there was a huge revolution in religious thinking again. So we had the tribal phase, city-states. Then he calls the emergence of these, the big guys, we can say, uh, the axial age of religion. And he sees a big pivot from the city-state religion where the God rules just the city to now overarching themes for whole cultures. 
as civilization becomes um, 